Okay, I think we're live. So, um, okay, this is weird. I, I've been recording these sessions for two years and uh, this is the first time I've uh, actually given one and it's kind of odd to have uh, no uh, nothing to interact with. Um, so uh, so anyway, uh, this session is called Up Your Game, Improving the Remote Office Home Studio Virtual Presence. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, what you can do to uh, up your game in delivering a session just like this, or in just having a regular Zoom meeting, or in um, maybe perhaps because you are the IT person in your uh, space, uh, that you are responsible for everything that has a wire attached to it. And that now includes um, virtual meetings and, um, and everything related to them. So, um, so um, sorry, I've got way too many things open right now. Okay, so um, we're gonna uh, take a look at what it takes to make good video calls. Um, this session is gonna be largely focused on Zoom, but it will um, have tips for any sort of a, an event, uh, a virtual event where you are on camera. Um, we will uh, take a look at um, some of the requirements that make for uh, good events. Um, we'll specifically look at what it takes to make um, Zoom calls more successful. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at something that wasn't even available two years ago. Um, you know, before the pandemic hit, we were probably all familiar with WebEx. Um, the the entire landscape has changed. Uh, I remember when I um, first was asked to uh, install Zoom at event at an event. Um, I thought, oh, this is cute, um, but really didn't give it much more thought. And then probably probably one year, maybe two years later all of a sudden it was everywhere uh, out of extreme necessity. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at um, what we've learned over the last two years in order to make, uh, make for better calls. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a former programmer. Uh, many of you may know me. Uh, for those of you that haven't, um, I started programming uh, in Fox. Well, actually a little bit before that, uh, but um, I spent a lot of time uh, writing Fox code, um, moved into .NET, spent uh, the, the end of my programming career doing all web-based things. Um, I started a software company called Geeks and Gurus in 2000. I was lucky enough to be partnered with uh, Rick Schumer and Steve Sawyer for a while. And um, we had um, a lot of mom and pop uh, clients, which of course Fox was perfect for. Uh, but we also leveraged our, our collective knowledge and built apps for uh, big international travel agencies and uh, large uh, food companies when I was lucky enough to work with uh, Eric Selge uh, for a while. Um, and uh, kind of a funny thing happened along the way. Uh, we discovered that we were actually an AV company, uh, not a software company. And... Um, what happened was in 1999, when I quit my full-time job and started working part-time out of my house with a brand new baby, uh, somebody called me and asked me if um, I could bail them out because a vendor wanted to, uh, was going to do a cyber cafe in 1999, um, and the vendor bailed. And um, for those of you that can remember, in 1999, there was really no such thing as a cyber cafe. Uh, we connected eight recently retired desktop PCs and um, uh, connected them to two phone lines and people got onto whatever there was back then. I, I think it must've been just AOL and CompuServe. And uh, one thing led to another. And now we still have one software com customer that we can't get rid of, but we're pretty much a full-time uh, audio visual company. Uh, Although some of you may have seen the name and the logo supporting this conference for a few years, uh, we officially launched Conference Geeks uh, back in um, March, April, um, March, I don't remember, um, at a trade show here in Denver. I'm in uh, Colorado Springs and we went up to Denver and, um, and uh, launched this to make a, a clear focus on uh, our AV services and kind of separate from our geeks and gurus past. So, um, 
so in March of 2020, like many of you, um, our world our worlds changed. Um, we uh, we we had done a, an in person event in January in Washington D.C. Our next in person event was supposed to be March 14th uh, of 2020, and um, on March 13th. I was lucky enough to uh, be doing uh, lights and sound for my son's production of Pirates of Penzance. And this was a Friday night. And, um, uh, you know, a few weeks earlier, my wife had said to me, hey, uh, this pandemic's going to affect you. And I'm like, ah, I don't think so. But, you know, I don't think we even called it a pandemic yet. But she said, you know, this is going to affect you. And so on this night, um, uh, the director, the school director was smart enough to say, hey, um, this is supposed to be, um, you know, the the Friday night show. Saturday night is supposed to be senior night. Um, let's do this senior night thing. Uh, Friday, sorry, uh, in case Saturday doesn't happen. And so we did Friday night. And I was lucky enough to have my son bring me up on stage and thank me for everything we did together. Um, so it was, it was, um, you know, still a little like, well, is this real? Like, is this, is everything, is everything that did happen really going to happen? And we weren't sure. So the next night um, we did our last in-person event of the year. Um, this was a room of 500 hunters and they were all hundred percent sure that um, COVID was fake and that even if it was real, it wasn't going to affect them. Uh, at the same time, they had um, hand sanitizer everywhere, and they used it every time they walked by it. So like that slide said a few minutes ago, a few slides ago, uh, we had to do a hard pivot. And we had to figure out, you know, what are we going to do to stay in business? And um, we had, um, sorry, I need to go back a couple slides because my notes are there. Um, we had um, two April events uh cancel completely. Um, we had a July event uh, decide that they were going to go virtual, but none of us knew what that meant. And so we started looking at all the platforms um, and, and there were already dozens of platforms and now there are hundreds of platforms. Um, we had an in-person event scheduled for July for 1,200 people. And in April, they decided uh, we were going to pivot to virtual and Geeks and Gurus was um, going to make that happen. Um, we had a fall event scheduled, which is um, this slide that I was on. Um, this was a group of lawyers, and this was actually a fundraising dinner. And there were five or 600 of them. And uh, the, the customer, so my customers are meeting planners, and their customers are associations or organizations of, of some sort or another. And that customer decided that they wanted to have a Zoom meeting for 500 people so that everybody could turn their cameras on so they could all talk to each other because this was supposed to be a social event. This was supposed to be a dinner. And so they wanted to have this um, meeting with 500 people, but they wanted to have um, the editor of the Washington Post and uh, the New York Times and um, uh, Andrea Mitchell from MSNBC and a guy from CBS whose name I can never remember, John something, uh, they were going to be the, the kind of keynote presentation. So people were going to come into the main meeting. Uh, there were going to be some general announcements from the board and things like that. And then they were all going to go into breakout rooms. And then they were you know, basically their dinner. Um, so breakout rooms of like 10 people. And then they were going to come back and they were going to watch what they wanted to be a webinar um, so that these four celebrities could be insulated from the 500 people who all had their cameras on. And so we figured it out and we pumped a Zoom webinar into a Zoom meeting and it was largely successful. Um, we had to uh, play videos and move slides and uh, highlight certain presenters. And we had done none of this before, like absolutely zero. Um, we could change slides on a, on a PC in a room, no problem. Um, we could switch between PCs in a room, but doing all of this virtually and uh, everything was just all brand new to us. So it was super successful. Um, we had another customer that decided that um, they wanted to um, pre-record all of the content for a virtual event. 
And so they had about 50 presenters giving 10 to 15 minute talks. And we looked into a lot of technologies and um, discovered that um, there were some roadblocks to many of the other to many of the other platforms besides Zoom. So we learned two big things. One was that the proprietary systems uh, were largely browser-based, like Hopin is, but Hopin seems to work. Um, but we had problems getting through firewalls. So when we had lawyers or people in hospitals trying to connect to do these recordings um, or to present live, uh, they struggled a lot to get through the firewalls, uh, their corporate firewalls. Um, and then on the other hand, we looked at a lot of platforms that all just used Zoom anyway. So uh, we spent a lot of time uh, learning how to use uh, Zoom and um, navigating many ins and outs. And so um, all of this is just to tell you um, why I've learned what I've learned and why I think that I have some practical experience that can be leveraged by, um, by all of you. Or at least I, I hope that's the case. That's why I pitched this. Um, so then more recently, uh, we did another event, and I, I have these slides out of order, um, but 13 of us went to Dallas to run a, a virtual conference that had as many as 13 concurrent breakout rooms. And so we all went to Dallas, we ran the Zoom rooms from... I'm, 13 breakout rooms in the in the terms that you and I would use them at an in-person conference, but 13 concurrent Zoom meetings or Zoom webinars, depending on the case. And so we um, used a, a bunch of different hotel rooms to manage that whole process. Um, some of you may recognize my brother, DJ. Uh, he was there with me and um, uh, helped us run this show. Um, we... Um, yeah, I have the slides out of order. Sorry. Um, this was an event that was uh, our first in-person event in the fall of 2021. And uh, the attendance was really light. And many of the presenters uh, could not be there in person, uh, either for business reasons or for, for um, COVID reasons. And so we brought the presenters in virtually. And we put them up on 55-inch screens in front of the room and every one of them came in over Zoom, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about the technology we used to put them up in the room so that um, we could have this um, truly hybrid meeting. Uh, these slides, again, are out of order, but um, the um, one that virtual event that we had 13 people in Dallas, we had met a few months earlier and actually recorded a bunch of the content um, uh, in advance of that conference. So we had uh, different sets. Sometimes it was couches. Sometimes it was uh, looked more like, uh, you know, a sports TV show. Um, but, but again, all of this was new to us. And um, the virtual recording got so intense that even when I would have to like go to uh, pick up my sons from college, um, I had to pack everything with me so that I could do virtual recordings in hotel rooms uh, on my way to and from. So we've spent a ton of time deep into this virtual world. Um, and we've come across a lot of cool tools and a lot of cool hardware. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more a little bit later. So again, we're going to talk a little bit generally about uh, what does it take to make some good video calls. Um, we're going to talk about hardware, uh, lighting, environment, uh, bandwidth. Um, and then we're going to take a look at some things specific to Zoom and then some ways of, of um, in, in, uh, in our Fox terminology, extending Zoom. And, um, and then uh, depending on how much time we have, hopefully take a look at some hardware uh, that has made our lives uh, easier and, and a little bit fun in, as we've been going. So um, three... Uh, big things that that go into any um, any sort of uh, video call. Uh, one is system resources. Um, I have gotten in the habit of running um, Activity Monitor on my Mac and Task Manager and Resource Monitor on my PCs uh, constantly. Um, and uh, we've done events where by uh, by the end of the event, we have pumped so much stuff through the system that all the numbers were kind of peaking and it got a little bit scary. Um, but it is important to pay attention to your system resources. Um, you know, uh, 
if you uh, spoke at this conference or at any of the other virtual Fox Fests, um, Tamar and Doug and Rick gave you uh, advice to shut down things you don't need. Um, things like Teams run all kinds of processes in the back end. Uh, I've, I mean, I shut down, actually, I didn't shut down Dropbox, but I normally shut down Dropbox. I shut down anything that can take processor time away from my virtual meeting. Um, and it's, you have to pay attention to all the resources. It's not just your CPU. So depending on what platform you're on, you wanna look at your, your monitors in such a way that you can see your CPU, your, your GPU, your network, your disk load. Um, and also, uh, I've particularly been burned, uh, not literally, uh, but by temperature issues uh, on, on my MacBook Pro. Um, the Mac, when it starts to get hot, will uh, start to throttle its own processor. And uh, Zoom doesn't play well when the, thro the processor is being throttled. So, um, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, so you definitely need to pay attention to your resources, shut everything down. Um, and uh, just keep what you need running, running. So in terms of audio, um, there are a variety of options that uh, we can use to, um, to uh, deliver our Zoom or our virtual calls, but audio is important. If somebody can't see you, but they can hear you, you can still deliver your content. Now, in a session like Doug's just now, or Rick's, or Tamar's, um, or uh, Tuvia's, not being able to see wouldn't be very helpful. Uh, but for a good number of Zoom calls, um, bad video quality is not a deterrent. Um, if you can either roughly see the person or roughly see their slides, uh, you can get the gist of what they're delivering as long as you can hear what they're saying. Uh, on the other hand, most content um, is not designed to be viewed without some audio backup. So it is important that we, um, we have good audio. And so, in these virtual environments, we have some choices in microphones. Um, almost, I think, every new laptop uh, now has an internal microphone. Um, they've gotten better over time, uh, but they're not always great. And sometimes uh, if you're taking notes and the microphone is right uh, you know, next to the keyboard or on top of the keyboard, uh, you're going to hear that clicking. Um, so the, the internal microphones are usually your last choice. Um, headsets are kind of a mixed blessing. Um, when we all got into Zoom or other virtual meetings, um, the software was not great uh, in terms of suppressing uh, the audio in the room with you. So you often got that feedback loop because the microphone would pick up your own laptop speakers. And so we all moved to headsets so that the sound was coming from one place and the mic was picking up just what was happening in the room. Um, there was a movement, or maybe still be still is a movement, um, that uh, said, you know what, we are. This is the world we're living in now. Um, if we can look more natural, if we can uh, move to earbuds, or maybe move to nothing at all and have good sound, then then let's do that. And Zoom really supported that very well. Uh, Zoom's built-in noise canceling functionality uh, was was the first really good solution uh, for for managing that. Um, but the the headset microphones um, can range from twenty nine dollars to a thousand dollars. And so, depending on how good a quality you want and what you need, there's a, there's a wide variety of choices out there. Uh, cameras have built-in microphones, and sometimes they're really good, and sometimes they're really bad, and sometimes they're really close to you, and sometimes they're really far away. Uh, so cameras um, are not always uh, um, the, the mics and cameras are not always the best. Um, uh, in a minute, I'm going to show you some of the things on my desk and um, and talk through a few of them. Um, the next level of microphone is typically a USB mic. And there are very cheap ones that are not very good, and there are very expensive ones that are very good. Uh, we're going to look at the one on my desk, which is about $250, and I'll tell you why I chose that. For me, may not be uh, suitable for you. And then at the high end, um, if you need to capture multiple microphones or if you need 
uh, to do a hybrid event like some of the pictures I showed you, um, then you're probably looking at uh, you know a, a, a real a real you can't see my air quotes a real microphone um, where we're looking at um, a, a, a studio type audio connector an XLR connector. Um, in most of the in-person events that we've done, we've had to run mics into a, a mixing board and send that audio back out to Zoom. And so then we're looking at a, you know, a higher end uh, microphone for those purposes. Uh, in terms of cameras, uh, again, there's a huge range. Um, we have a customer that just before the, the pandemic uh, equipped 70 people with brand new Dells that had the camera down at the, at the hinge between the screen and the the keyboard. And so you had a great shot of everybody's nose. Um, not ideal for the pandemic we were about to encounter. Um, additionally, the video quality wasn't that great. Um, my MacBook Pro has a, a built-in camera that is really disappointing. Uh, particularly given the quality of the cameras they build into their phones. Um, so, uh, you know, the built-in uh, webcams are, are hit or miss. Um, you can buy all kinds of external uh, webcams. Um, the Logitech Brio is probably the best bang for the buck. Um, I'm sorry I don't have that pricing information in front of me, but it is in the white paper. Um, but when this all started, uh, the experts were, were uh, recommending the Logitech Brio. Uh, it was impossible to get, uh, as was almost anything at that point in time. Um, but it, it's a really good, stable camera. Um, it has really good video resolution, uh, really good with backlighting situations, um, things like that. Um, there are a variety of other cameras. Um, you know, you, you've all seen 4K TVs for a long time. There are 4K cameras. There are now 4K web cameras. Uh, depending on what you're doing, that may or may not be necessary. Um, for most phone calls, video calls, uh, Zoom calls, you don't need a 4K camera. Uh, but they do have some interesting features. Um, there's now combinations of hardware and software where you can actually treat that 4K screen as multiple cameras. Uh, there's been some new stuff just announced in the last week. So basically with one camera, you can have a tight shot and a wide shot, and you can use your phone or your laptop to control which, which camera angle is being sent to your video feed. Um, and then there's higher end stuff. Um, there's DSLR cameras like you might use to take pictures uh, normally uh, that have an HDMI output. Um, one of the key things to look at when you're looking at DSLR cameras is that it has a clean HDMI output. Uh, if you don't have a clean HDMI output, you might get like the rangefinder view or you might get the numbers that you might see when you're looking at the camera. Um, so uh, there's a variety of DSLR uh, cameras and there's all kinds of YouTube videos and, uh, and other resources for uh, good DSLR cameras for the world we're living in today. Um, and then, uh, there have been a number of um, higher end cameras, and we're gonna take a look at uh, some of that here in a minute, um, that um, are great, but maybe don't play uh, into a laptop or, um, or into an HDMI switcher like we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Uh, just in the last week, there was a big trade show in Vegas. Um, there are a bunch of these higher end cameras that um, now have the op option to uh, work over all the old uh, professional video standards, as well as the prosumer HDMI, and now even as USB webcams. Um, there's also uh, cameras that um, do auto tracking, and we may or may not look at one later today. Uh, I have one set up here. Uh, we'll see if the, the technology gods are, are playing in my favor. Um, Rick, you would have hated my life for the last two years with your love for technology uh, and hardware. Um, and then uh, another type of camera, there are cameras that have built-in live streaming. So I have a camera uh, that I can take to my son's track meets. I can hook up to uh, my, uh, I can bond with my phone and I can live stream straight from the camera. And that camera actually is one of the cameras that has the, uh, the multiple ang uh, angles so that you can, um, so that you can have a white shot, a wide shot and a tight shot. It also has like built in captioning and lower thirds and, and things like that. So there's a ton of variety out there. Uh, what I would recommend is that um, 
at very least, um, you look at an external camera that um, uh, is, is a step above the built-in webcam. Um, as a caveat, um, there are some some laptops that have some pretty good cameras. Uh, there are um, the new Macs supposedly have really good cameras, uh, but that's just like in the last six to twelve months. So, um, so if everything works nicely for me, um, let's switch to this. Okay. This, uh, I'm really starting at the wrong end. This is kind of a high-end camera. This is what they call a PTZ camera, pan, tilt, and zoom. And this particular camera is made by a company called Bird Dog. And it has a controller, which I will show you in a minute or two. Um, but this is out uh, my back window and the trees in the foreground are close to the house. But if I push a couple of buttons, uh, it would help if I was on the right camera. Still not working. Oh, because I'm hitting the wrong buttons. I'm still on the wrong camera. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm on the right camera now. And if I hit the right buttons, What am I doing wrong? There we go. Uh, all I did was change the focus on that camera and you are now looking at the top of Pikes Peak and the brand new visitor center. Um, so this camera has a joystick controller so that I can zoom in and out, I can pan left and right. And this camera has a uh, old fashioned, uh, old fashioned, but very technology, technologically capable uh, SDI output, which runs over uh, BNC, which you might've seen um, uh, back in your networking days. Um, it also has an HDMI output and it also has something called NDI, uh, which allows you to send the signal over a, a ethernet cable and, um, and deal with it that way. Uh, the controls are all done over Ethernet. Um, and you can control this through a physical hardware controller like I have, or uh, through a, a laptop, computer, tablet, um, whatever. So let me switch to a different camera. And so that's the controller I was just talking about. And so um, what I wasn't doing correctly was pushing these buttons, uh, but I have all these presets, so I can uh, zoom in uh, just by pushing a button. I can take a completely different angle by pushing a button. Um, and we're gonna look at some of the other hardware on my desk in a minute. And um, so that is at the high end. Um, somewhere in the middle, uh, we have uh, switch cameras again. No, that's the right camera. Um, switch cameras here and go to preset four. And nothing happened. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> camera two. Because I'm hitting the wrong buttons. Okay. This is a, an Avaya camera. Uh, another brand name is called Huddle Cam. Um, this camera. Uh, has a, um, a different type of pan, tilt, zoom. It doesn't really pan, tilt, and zoom, but it comes with a remote control so that you can uh, pan left, pan right, pan up, pan down, zoom in and zoom out, but it all happens um, magically inside the camera um, and it doesn't actually uh, rotate like um, the, the, the real PTZ cameras. Above it, I have what's called an Osbot Tiny Cam. This camera, actually, uh, I'm not going to demonstrate it, but it has auto tracking. Um, I hold up a gesture, which is just a, a solid hand, and um, 
from that, it will um, uh, capture in on me. And um, then I can move around the room or in a relatively reasonable space and uh, it will follow me uh, left, right, up and down. Um, and it works, it works pretty well. Um, this company has recently released a 4K version of this. So you get some more advanced features with the, uh, with the 4K. Um, the microphone that I'm using today, see if I can get this right this time, is this Shure uh, microphone. And this was uh, like 250, I think, with the stand. And the reason that I chose this microphone was because it um, works as a USB microphone, so I can plug it directly into a laptop, but it also has that XLR connection that I was talking about before, so that if I need to uh, plug this into a mixer or if I'm a podcaster or something like that, um, it gives me uh, some, more, some more flexibility. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a couple other things on my desk and then we'll talk about why I have them and what we're doing with them a little bit later. So um, this device is called a Stream Deck. Um, if you haven't uh, worked with one of these, um, well, I'll demonstrate it later. Um, if you haven't worked with one of these, um, it uh, is life-changing in a lot of ways beyond just the video production stuff that we're doing. Um, we use this to basically queue up all of our work um, uh, yesterday, and I hope to demonstrate a little bit of this uh, if, I, if I don't run out of time. Um, yesterday, uh, DJ and I both uh, co-produced an event uh, that uh, basically took place in Michigan, but it was virtual. Uh, DJ was in Michigan and I was here in Colorado. And I uh, used this Stream Deck to uh, queue up all the slides that we needed for the presentation, as well as the videos. And DJ used this Stream Deck to actually interact with Zoom. And uh, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But the Stream Deck has made um, our workflow very easy. It's a whole lot easier to push buttons on a device like this than it is to interact with um, software. Uh, I don't know how many of you have trouble with Zoom. Um, just muting and unmuting or ending the meeting. Uh, I use the Stream Deck just for simple stuff like that uh, because Zoom keeps moving buttons around uh, as I'm sharing my screen or as somebody else is sharing their screen and the Stream Deck will keep those buttons right where I want them. So I'll talk a little bit more about that Stream Deck later. Um, I actually have two on my desk. I, this one is called the XL and I have a smaller one, uh, which I think is called the mini. No, because there's a one. There's one even smaller than that. Maybe this is just the regular one. Um, but so this one has 15 keys. Uh, the other one has 32 keys, I think. Um, I'm. Uh, this is this is not something that I think everybody needs, but it has made my life uh, super easy. Um, this is a 43 inch display that has four HDMI uh, inputs on the back. Uh, and can handle each, each of these inputs can come from a different source. And so um, what you're seeing right now uh, is um, my program out is in the top left. My multi view, which lets me see all my different feeds is in the bottom left. And then um, in the upper right is a, 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 a PC that is running some graphic software that um, may or may not work because um, I seem to have broken it in the 15 minutes that I had to uh, uh, get fired up. Um, <laughs> Rick, it's a, it's a pretty nice, I saw your, your message. It was a pretty nice uh, monitor. And uh, for what it does, it was like 750 bucks, not terribly uh, unreasonable, I thought. Um, so uh, what else do I have on my desk? Um, um, the, the thing that has really been revolutionary for me over the last uh, two years has been this family of products. Um, this device is called an ATEM Mini Extreme ISO, and uh, it lets me uh, switch between eight different HDMI inputs. And so I've been using that to switch between the cameras and the slides. Um, it also has um, a bunch of other functionality, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, we started out with a, a smaller version of this um, 
that starts, I think, at $295 and it has four inputs and one output. This has eight put inputs and two outputs. Um, it also um, has USB-C outputs. Uh, I'm using one of those right now to feed my camera into hop in. So everything that I do on this device ends up coming to you as my camera feed. I can use the other USB-C uh, port to record onto uh, a hard drive and I can record um, what you're seeing, the program out, as well as each one of these individual feeds as a separate file. And um, then I can use Blackmagic's uh, editing software to uh, mix and match those feeds as I see fit um, in, in editing later. Um, and so then just kind of the uh, um, overview here, that's kind of what I'm working with. Now, uh, truth be told, this setup is more complex than any single event we've done. Um, in order to show it all to you at the same time, um, I've uh, been sweating quite a bit trying to make it all work. And um, that ATEM Mini that I just showed you uh, wasn't outputting to hop in uh, 15 minutes before the session started. So I had to unplug it and plug it back in. And uh, I wasn't smart enough to save some of the settings uh, for some of the things that I had prepped for you guys. So there's at least um, a couple things that aren't gonna uh, work exactly the way I want them to, uh, but nevertheless. Um, and so uh, just kind of um, generally, um, none of this, stuff individually is terribly expensive. Um, all of it together has added up to quite a bit. Um, the cameras, um, that Avaya camera uh, that has the built-in pan, tilt and zoom, uh, you can get it used online uh, for under 200, I think. Um, the Ozbots are, uh, I think, 199 to 299. Um, the the higher end cameras, the pan, tilt, and zoom cameras that I use to show you my desk. Um, so we bought a, a set of those, three of them plus the controller, and that was closer to nine grand. Um, so I've got quite a range here. Um, the the switchers uh, start at two ninety five and go up to like thirteen hundred. Um, but we would not have stayed in business if we didn't have to learn all of this technology and invest in it. And we were able to do some rentals up front to, um, to get started, uh, but, um, but the quickly became purchases. Um, so I'm sorry, I completely have forgotten to stop and ask for questions. Um, I don't see any in the chat. Um, Tamara, is that right? I just have one for you and you really okay. don't have to watch the chat. I will watch it. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you're so used to it by now, I know. Yes, exactly. Okay. So we got a question. I have a video camera with an HDMI out and I have to use a capture card to convert it to a USB input feed so Zoom can see it. I use an Elgato HD60S Plus. What capture card do you recommend? Um, so um, Elgato is um, uh, a perfectly acceptable brand. Um, lots of people use them. Um, there are uh, several others. Um, I don't know that you really need to spend any more money, but Blackmagic, uh, the company that makes the, the video switcher that I'm using, um, has a, a, a couple of them. Um, so I think that, um, you know, if you're just trying to do a one-to-one, -one, just do HDMI out, HDMI out uh, into your USB um, input feed, just like you're doing it, I think you're doing fine. Um, I, I don't think that you really need anything better than the Elgato. Okay, that's the only one that we have, so go on. Okay, all right, so um, some general um, some general requirements for any Zoom meeting. Uh, I'm sorry, you can't see that because I did not switch back to my slides. Okay, um, so, um, Wired is always better than wireless. Um, in, in the white paper, I said wireless is not ever better than uh, wired. Um, we have seen so many glitches just because of the internet connection. Um, so I said audio is super important. Uh, your internet connection is, is equally as important. Um, and uh, Every platform lists the requirements, and, and I'll click on into Zooms in a minute. Um, 
but uh you know, like, uh, again, um, Tamar, Rick and Doug sent out uh, an email to the speakers, um, or maybe Tamar just said it um, verbally, I don't know. Um, but um, you, if you are doing something critical, if you are, um, you know, producing a company meeting, or if you're doing a job interview, um, anything that's critical, it is important to kick everybody else off the internet. Um, I don't care how good your connection is. Um, you don't know when some other piece of hardware is suddenly going to pull hard on your wire. And uh, particularly if, um, if there's a lot of, um, you know, videos being watched in your house or online gaming or things like that, um, you really need to, um, eat. some people have their own dedicated connection. I know um, many people in this new line of work for me um, that have uh, two uh, internet connections into their house. Uh, they will also use dual internet connections um, to do something called bonding the their bandwidth so that they can uh, either get twice the bandwidth or so they can have one as a backup in case one goes down. Um, we have not gotten into that. And I tell you, every important event we do, uh, it stresses me out, uh, but it's not a cheap, uh, it's not a cheap endeavor. Um, so uh, bandwidth is really critical. And, and again, everybody uh, posts their own requirements. Um, for Zoom, it's not it's not terrible. Um, you know, for years, we've always paid attention to download speed. Well, now we really also have to pay attention to upload speed. And so when we do an event on site in a hotel, um, that's not something they've been used to catering to. And so we've had to jump through some hoops to make sure that we get the upload uh, so that we can send something back out to Zoom or uh, some other streaming service. So um, bandwidth requirements are important. You need to know what they are and you need to make sure that you've you've got coverage. Um, you know, like I, I just admitted, we don't do much in terms of redundancy. Uh, we do uh, back each other up, DJ and I do, so that um, if we're um, uh, if we're looking at um, uh, running an event, um, we will have the slides and the videos in both locations. Um, videos are a little tricky because if we're two in, two minutes into a ten minute video uh, and my internet drops, um, DJ can't really just pick up where I left off. So maybe we have to start over. Um, we, we have not had this happen, uh, knock on the plastic table that I'm sitting at, um, but we have not had that happen. Um, but so there are, there are issues for redundancy that we don't have covered. Um, and it's only important really when we're playing videos. Um, and some of our events are pretty video intensive. Um, so, um, so, um, so internet is important. Um, other things about your environment. Um, so distractions, um, we already talked about like system distractions, like turn off your email, turn off Facebook, turn off all those things, turn off your phone. Um, if you are in a public space, do what you can to isolate yourself and better yet, don't be in a public space. Um, your background is important. Um, and, um, there are, there are, uh, several things to uh, consider when it comes to, to background. Uh, when we first got into this two years ago, uh, we saw so many um, backgrounds that were either, um, I don't know what words to use, but but they ended up being distracting, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons. Um, we had uh, one lawyer who had all kinds of books and you could read the titles of the books. And so people in the chat were reading the book titles into the chat. Um, we had other ones where, you know, like it was somebody's bedroom and they didn't make the bed and there was a, a hamper full of dirty clothes and, and all of that kind of stuff. So there's that, like, you need to be aware of what other people are seeing. Um, there's a, the issue of, of, of privacy that is a concern for some people. Um, we do a meeting that has foundation trustees where they get on in their homes and they don't want people to see what their homes look like. And so sometimes it's just using the built-in features to blur a background. Sometimes it's um, using some of the, you know, the fake uh, virtual backgrounds that Zoom and Teams and other platforms have. Sometimes it's putting up a green screen. Um, Tuvia, I noticed you had a green screen in, uh, in your office uh, earlier today. I have one here and I don't think you've seen it yet, but I'm not sure, but we, we might get there. Um, but so uh, the background is really important. 
Um, uh, um, virtual backgrounds in general um, are not ideal. Uh, a green screen is better. And if you put the virtual background up on a green screen, you're going to get better quality. Zoom in particular dumbs down your video quality if you are using uh, their built-in uh, virtual backgrounds. Um, so something to be aware of. Um, lighting is really important. And the, the room that I'm in right now is not well lit. Um, let me see what you get if I switch to this. Okay. So, um, so I am in a room that has a single uh, four foot, well, two four foot fluorescent tubes above me. Um, it's well lit, but it's not, um, it's, it's bright, but it's not well lit. And so um, this is not an ideal situation. Um, I uh, yesterday set up some extra lighting, uh, but decided that it wasn't worth it, um, that it was really more important to talk about it. Um, again, if you're doing uh, just Zoom calls, uh, interacting with your teammates, um, you know, the, the, the normal kind of day-to-day -day business stuff, this might not be important. However, you don't want to have a big, bright window behind you. Um, you are going to be in the shadows, and that is distracting. We talk about Zoom fatigue, uh, or, or, or they uh, talk about Zoom fatigue a lot. Um, Zoom fatigue uh, is two things. It is, um, well, it's at least two things. One is looking at yourself. Uh, sorry, this is off topic, but um, it is looking at yourself. Uh, people stress when they look at themselves and aren't happy with what they see. Um, or, I mean, that's generally it. They're not happy with what they see. Um, the world we live in expects so much of us. Uh, in some ways, I think Zoom has helped. Um, you know, the number, uh, my wife and I shared an office for the first year, um, and the number of times that uh, people would come onto her calls and say, um, you know, yeah, I didn't bother with makeup today, uh, which is not something they would have ever done in the office. So in some ways, it was a little bit relaxed. Uh, in other ways, it was a little bit more stressful. Um, so lighting is important. And if I have to look at you with a big bright window behind you and you're in the shadows, that is stress. That is subconscious stress. And that is what leads, that is one of the kinds of things that leads to Zoom fatigue. Um, so uh, composition and framing. Um, uh, I am a little bit off center. Um, oh, you're not, you don't even see me. Um, so that frame that uh, just went away, that's where you should be in a Zoom call. Um, there are reasons where you might not be. Um, you might be demonstrating something, and so you need space off to your side. Uh, you may have your logo up over your shoulder, and you don't want to block it. Um, but um, but framing is really key. Uh, where framing is particularly important these days is um, if you are on a platform like uh, Teams, where uh, you go into gallery view and it cuts off your left and right hand side, um, you may get cut off. And so being centered in the frame is important. Um, when we talk about Zoom production at the end of this talk, um, again, it is important because we will not be showing your full camera feed. Uh, we will be uh, showing uh, some portion of your camera feed. And so being properly centered is important. Um, the last thing was arrangement. And what that really is, is, is about lighting uh, and um, lighting and, and microphone. Um, you want the microphone to be close to you. Uh, you want it to be in front of you and away from other noises. And lighting, uh, you really want to have um, uh, in front of you uh, if you get into uh, really um, more advanced situations. If you're using a green screen, you actually have... Um, if you're, uh, if you're using green screens, um, you actually want to have light on the screen and on the subject, uh, two different, at least two different sources of lighting. Uh, you want to have um, big sources of lighting, not necessarily bright, but not small. Uh, like the ring lights that came out when we first went into this pandemic were really too small. They were a single source uh, that did not do a good job of, of spreading light across the subject. And so... Um, Either big, big ring lights or multiple lights are really helpful. Uh, again, if you're in charge of, of letting your CEO uh, do these kinds of calls and you need to set up a green screen for them, you really want to light that up well so that um, everything is, is crystal clear uh, when it comes across to the other end. 
Uh, okay, uh, I'll stop for questions before I talk about virtual cameras. Okay, we have a couple. One was, have you looked into Starlink as backup internet net connection? Uh, it has been on my radar, but I have not looked into it seriously. And I'm, um, I, I think that it may not actually be available in Colorado, which is why I haven't looked at, or at least in Colorado Springs. Um, but I, I have not, it's on my radar, have not looked into it. Okay. And the other is, what tips do you have for eliminating the latency that is delayed audio in Zoom? And that's all we have right now. Okay. So that's a really big issue. Um, and, uh, and I haven't really, uh, I've kind of skirted the issue. And when I went to my camera, um, you may have seen uh, some pretty bad latency. And I'll talk about that too. Um, so if you are on, uh, and again, I didn't show this slide, but um, or this screen, but Zoom has specs uh, for for the client as well. And if you are somewhere in the middle of their specs, the actual latency shouldn't be bad. Um, where we see the audio latency uh, pop up in a one-on-one -on -one meeting is um, when something else is stealing processor cycles and it can get really bad. Uh, a little bit technical, um, Zoom records the video and the audio two different ways. Um, and you can look at the statistics and it will show you the latency. It will show you dropped frames. It will show you jiggliness. Um, it shows you several things. Um, but generally, if you are on a good internet connection, we don't see that latency unless something is stealing processor cycles. Um, we, I mean, we have, we, we just saw it over the last two days, we've seen it. Um, but in both of those cases, I can see from the Zoom statistics, and I, I, if, if I forget, I will, uh, I would like to show them the, the screen that you see that at the end today, um, or somewhere later. Um, but uh, we generally don't see it. Where we do see it is when you are using different sources for video and audio. And so when I am running audio through, when I'm running audio and video through the switcher, which I did, and, and I'll just go back there for a minute. Um, I can't tell from this end, uh, but there may be a pretty good delay because I have one source sending you my audio. My audio is going straight through the laptop. And then the video is going into that Blackmagic switcher and then into the laptop. And that almost always introduces latency. So the, the switcher, actually has um, some, some settings in it so that you can adjust that latency. And so if you're doing that, that is one option. Uh, the best option, if you're doing multiple input sources like that, is to feed the audio directly into a camera. And so when you get to those DSLRs with the HDMI outs, they generally also have an audio in. And the, um, the PTZ cameras I'm using um, have um, an audio in. And so we will feed the audio, even if we're in a room, a huge, especially if we're in a huge room and we've got four microphones feeding into a mixer, we will take the audio directly out of that mixer and pump it into one of the cameras, just one. We only need it in one. Um, we will often run mics on the other cameras so that we can sync them up later, uh, sync up the video with the good audio track. Uh, but that's generally um, where we see it the most. And that may not apply to the, the question, um, but it is, it is rarely seen if you have a good internet connection. So, um, okay. So virtual cameras, what are they? Why would you use them? Um, this is kind of a broad, I'm kind of broadening uh, what I mean by this. Um, I was going to do a, a demo of virtual camera. I'm not going to do what I was going to do, but I will come back to this a little bit later. Um, but there are um, a variety of virtual cameras that let you do a number of things. One is um, uh, simply uh, giving you the ability uh, to switch your slides and your camera um, like I've been doing, but all on your own laptop. So you can have a, a virtual, you can have a piece of software that will capture your camera, capture your slides, capture your audio, and pump out a mixed version of that through a single, uh, a single virtual uh, camera output. 
And um, you can do things, some cool things with that. You can do uh, picture in picture. You can do side by side. You can do um, fifth thirds or which like when somebody puts their name up on the bottom of the screen or uh, other graphics. So um, so there's a lot of uh, use for virtual cameras. Uh, depending on what your platform is, they may or may not play nice. Um, I can't tell from my end how good the picture is of my slides. Um, and we're going to talk about video resolution in a little bit. Uh, but sometimes, um, like for example, in Zoom, if you use the advanced tab in Zoom to share slides, it is going to give you a super, super crisp uh, version of your slides. If you, on the other hand, run it out through a virtual camera, it may be a little hard to read. And we've run across this. We've had events where we've, we've recorded all the content in advance, including the slides, and the, the really fine text is really hard to see. So sometimes the virtual camera uh, can hurt you, um, but there are some advantages. Um, but mostly if, it's, if you're trying to do something a little bit beyond what a platform gives you, so if you want to do something just a little bit better, um, and so uh, on the Mac side, you'll people you'll see people talk about eCam uh, quite a bit. Um, there's a, a product called mm -hmm, uh, which actually lets you put your slides as a virtual background behind you. Um, there are uh, other virtual camera software fit packages that we've used to help us do testing. So. Um, we were in a scenario where we, um, early on, didn't know what we were doing, and we needed to do a, a, a proof of concept that we could um, put lower thirds, um, uh, uh, lower thirds over every speaker. And uh, in order to do that, we needed to. Um, well, there's more to it than that. But basically, we needed to test a scenario that had multiple speakers, uh, something like 16 over the course of a day, and panels of four at a time. And so we set up a bunch of cheap uh, laptops that we happen to have um, because we provide laptops to conferences. Um, and we ran virtual cameras on those so that they were each feeding a static picture of a person back into a Zoom meeting so that we could have four people or eight people or 12 people in the Zoom meeting at one time. And so there's a lot of uh, uses for virtual cameras. We don't use them seriously for anything, um, but there are certainly um, opportunities where they can come into play. Um, and, and the ones that we have played with are um, uh, mm -hmm, just to experiment. And um, I'm forgetting the name of the other one, I'm sorry, um, but the one that we used for this testing scenario that I just described. Um, okay, uh, so I'll stop here for uh, questions again. Just one at this moment. Can you show more about the green screen setup you are using today and describe the advantages? Um, okay, so um, again, we're going to get the latency. Um, I can't show you because I didn't set up the extra lights. Uh, so there's a couple things wrong with my setup. One is the lighting. Um, you can see that it's not even. You can see that it's a little bit darker uh, over here. That's not ideal. Uh, when I had the lighting set up yesterday, it was uh, perfectly evenly lit, uh, and that worked out really well. Uh, the other uh, problem with my scenario is that um, I am far too close to that screen. Ideally, you want about six feet between the subject and the screen. And um, if I uh, zoom out a little bit, you will see that that um, if I were six feet away from that screen, you would see the whole rest of this room. Uh, I'm using a, a very nice pop-up screen, uh, 150 bucks, I think. Um, uh, and uh, it's worked very well for us when we've used it. Um, but it is really um, ideal if you have uh, somebody standing and a camera in front of that person, and you're just kind of getting this kind of same shot, but you can put a little more distance and a little less width uh, between them. Uh, so the, the advantage of the green screen, um, 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 two things. One 
is even Zoom does a better job superimposing a virtual background uh, when you have a green screen, a green screen when it doesn't. The whole concept of chroma keying has been around forever. I mean, like everybody knows about this, right? Like we know that uh, when people do the weather, uh, the weather is not behind them, although that's changing now with LCD screens. Um, but so the, the idea of chroma keying, blue screens, green screens, um, that's been around for a really long time. And so the software and the hardware that have been developed around that are are well tested and robust. And so um, the switcher um, um, also has the ability to handle the, the uh, sorry, I've lost my mouse, um, uh, the ability to work with that. Um, and so um, if I turn, uh, I'm not getting it. Okay, don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, but, um, but I, I um, this switcher, and again, it was working all morning until I unplugged it and plugged back in. But I superimposed myself over um, I superimposed myself over this picture all day, and um, it, it was working beautifully. So you just saw the parts of me that are not green uh, up against that background, and so the ecosystem around green screens is pretty sophisticated and pretty robust. Um, I think that's pretty much, that was a very long-winded answer to the question. Um, but it's better than the built-in um, virtual, the built-in Zoom virtual screen or the built-in Teams virtual screen uh, because you, I mean, you've seen it. You've seen with those virtual screens that you will get that blur uh, more so with people that have hair um, um, uh, or their clothes. Um, the, the, the downside to green screen or balloon screen is you have to pay attention to what you're wearing. Um, and you'll notice like right now with that green screen background, my glasses are really crisp. If we had a virtual background behind me in Zoom, my glasses would like disappear into the background. Um, so, um, so, okay. Okay, well, we, while you were answering, several more questions came in. And okay, one of them good. is actually about glasses. A person wearing glasses will often appear on video with a bluish glare on their lenses. Any suggestion for minimizing this problem? So there's a couple of things that go into that. Um, so sometimes people are actually wearing um, uh, blue light uh, uh, glasses. And so they have a tint to them that I think looks particularly strong uh, over a video uh, environment. Um, um, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, um, the other thing is that if you have a green screen, like I do, um, you can get bounce back from the green or the blue screen, and that can show up in glasses. And so you, it is important, the lighting is really important. And so uh, typically what they tell you to do is place the lighting above the subject, um, and that helps uh, with the glare. If the lighting is dead on, you're definitely gonna get um, some sort of a, a reflection. Uh, one of the things they look for uh, on a positive side is a little bit of reflection. And so either just a, a tiny dot off the glasses or off the eye. Um, the I'll talk a little bit more about the, the people I've been paying attention to for the last two years, um, but they're all high-end video people. And so these are some things they actually look for. Um, but, but again, we all know the glare that you're talking about and we don't want that. And lighting is really the key. Sometimes you can't do anything about it, um, but it is, it, it is all about the angles. And so if it's something, if it's your desk and you have control over that and you can play with it, you will find an angle where that lighting is not a problem. If you're setting up a studio for, for yourself or for the CEO, same thing. Uh, the other thing there is, again, I mentioned big light sources versus um, small light sources. Um, you'll get more of that glare on the small light sources and less on the big. And then the other thing is uh, it's important to use diffusers. So if you have a light source that is um, really, um, uh, really focused and it, like you can see the LED bulbs in it, for example, um, you're gonna get more glare than if you put it behind a white piece of paper or you bounce it off something white or you bounce it off the ceiling or, um, or you use a professional diffuser. Um, you've probably all seen uh, at places like Pier 1, if they still exist, or sometimes at Ikea, um, you've seen what they call China balls. They're really big globes that have um, not very bright lights in them. Um, a lot of these guys are using China balls uh, to get that diffused light into a space. Okay. Um, 
So we've got one more, but tell me if you have time or if you'd rather hold that for the post session. No, go ahead. Okay. How much time do I have? About 10 minutes. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay. Let's hold that for the post session. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. No, I'm clearly talking too much. Okay. Um, oh, darn it. Okay. Um, okay. So um, a couple things about Zoom. Uh, so we all know about video resolution, right? Um, I'm not going to do a demo of this like I wanted to, but I'm going to talk you through some things you can do to get better resolution out of Zoom. Um, Zoom has, um, uh, and this is linked in the white paper, um, but they have different, uh, they tell you what they'll give you. Um, if you don't have group HD turned on and you have two more people in a room, you're only going to get 360 out. Um, if you have uh, two or more people and you have group HD turned on uh, and, and all these other variables, you can get 720 out. Um, but that is actually um, really hard to see. Um, and, it, and a lot of it depends on what you're actually doing. If you don't have somebody full screen in a Zoom meeting, they're not going to be sending 720. Well, why do you care if you, if you don't have them full screen? Maybe you don't. If everybody's in gallery view, you don't care what the resolution is because you can only see that 160 pixel square anyway. Um, but if you're recording this and if you're going to do editing on it later, um, you want to get the best resolution you can. And so uh, this, is, this is true for both what's being streamed live and what's being recorded to a desktop or in the cloud. And so we use tools so that we can put somebody on a second monitor and make them full screen so we get that high res, um, that high res output. Uh, and so um, it doesn't, even if you have Group HD uh, enabled in your account, in your account, the settings you can control, Zoom may not be giving it to you. If you have a business account, so I only have a pro account. If you have a business account, you can ask them to turn on higher res and then you can get full 1080, um, but you need to be at that high price point and, and you need to ask them to do it. Um, but there are some workarounds. And so um, can I cheat? Yes, I can. So we use a Zoom product called Zoom Rooms and it costs us like 50 bucks a month. We use two of them when we're in the middle of events uh, so that we can automatic, all we have to do is connect the Zoom Room to the meeting and it automatically bumps up that resolution. And so, um, so Zoom Rooms is one way of cheating and getting the higher resolution. It turns out that um, you can use a Facebook, I'm sorry, a meta portal, uh, which uh, uses the same technology as the Zoom Room. Um, the, uh, the, the, once you connect a portal to a zoom meeting, it will automatically bump everybody up to 720 P. Um, so what we're doing is paying $50 a month for two account, a uh, hundred dollars a month, uh, because we're using some of the other features that are built into the zoom room. Um, if, if all you want to do is bump up the resolution, uh, this is a good way to go. Okay. So, um, so the, the next part, um, Tomorrow I have until uh, 45. Correct. Okay. Okay. So the next part of this um, is what has really been exciting for us. Um, there's a guy named Andy Carluccio uh, recently, and I talk about him in the white paper, recently graduated from uh, UVA. Well, graduated right going into the pandemic. He was a, a dual major theater and um and computer programming. And he was just ripped apart because his peers in the theater industry couldn't do anything to make money. Um, you know, that was true for many, many people, but these were people he knew and loved, and he was just torn apart. And so he wanted to figure out how to leverage Zoom to do virtual productions. And he and a small team put together two products, uh, Zoom OSC, um, so two things here. One is like, this was kind of a, um, a weird uh, melding of my world because um, I didn't know that there was um, so much, um, um, so much software. I mean, this sounds stupid to say out loud, but I didn't know there was so much software behind all of this stuff and using tools that we've all learned about using things like 
HTTP calls, uh, REST protocols, um, APIs, uh, HTML, um, uh, CSS, like all of this stuff came like into my world again uh, in ways that I never expected it to. So Zoom OSC is a, is a clunky little product that uh, needs some tweaking, but these guys put it together and it allows you to control Zoom uh, from uh, a device like the Stream Deck like I showed you earlier um, or a number of other devices. But it, it takes the Zoom interface out of your life and gives you a lot more fine-tuned control. And it's two-way. So for example, we uh, just did a Zoom webinar yesterday with... Um, uh, uh, at one point, 30 panelists. And um, DJ wrote all the Zoom OSC commands so that we had a run of show and we would say, okay, so um, uh, let me just skip ahead to this button. Well, yeah, I'll skip to this. Um, okay, so we have buttons that say, clear all the spotlights. Spotlights is a Zoom thing. Um, and then spotlight a user called APCA. And then send John Kim a message that says, you're going live in 60 seconds. And then in like 45 seconds, send him another message that says, turn on your camera. And then spotlight him so he takes up the full screen. And then tell the next person they're coming on. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we had a button that could turn off a whole panel, a button that could prompt a whole panel, uh, a a button that would start a video, uh, you know, an actual video. Um, so DJ's, actually, this one was an event I did, but DJ side is typically this side, the Zoom OSC side. Uh, my side's usually easier. Um, and so the commands that you, you give it are really straightforward. Um, well, once you get used to them. So in my first example, I'm sending a command that says Zoom username chat. Username is a target. It's saying I'm sending this to a user. And so if there is somebody logged in named Doug, I say, um, I can't believe Stonefield's over 30 years old. And then I can send Tamara a message that says, uh, please turn on your video. And um, we have different types of targets. So you can send messages to everybody in the meeting, uh, to specific targets, to just a panelist, to just attendees. Um, where you can send it to everybody but panelists, um, all kinds of things. And so like everything that you can do through the Zoom UI, you can do in here plus more. Uh, DJ will have a page of buttons that will be polling the Zoom uh, back end. And so... Um, on his buttons, he might have a John. He might have three John Kim buttons. One that uh, says John Kim microphone. One that says John Kim video. Whatever. But they'll turn green or red depending on whether John Kim's mic or video is on or off. And so all of that stuff is two way, and it's it's phenomenal. Zoom ISO builds on that. Uh, requires a little more hardware. Uh, we use a Mac Mini M1. And um, we um, uh, hook up a couple, they're called pluggable devices to it. And um, we can get, I'm going to go backwards, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll hook up the Mac Mini and, um, and two pluggable devices. So now I get five HDMI outputs out of the Mac Mini. Um, that's not the right picture. This is. And so the one output is my user interface so that I can control Zoom ISO. Uh, the other four are um, screens that I've plugged into the A10 mini and that I have made full screen on each one of these presenters. And so I can um, mix and match um, uh, what I'm doing with that. And so um, as an example, let's see if I can make this work before I run out of time. Oh, did I lose my macros? Oh, I'm the wrong thing. Okay. So as an example, I could send out this feed or I could send out this feed or I could send out this feed or I could send out this feed. And so all of that was done through the magic of Zoom ISO. ISO is um, isolated feed. And so I could capture each um, um, camera as a, uh, each, I'm sorry, each Zoom participant as if it were a separate camera, feed it into my switcher, create what this is called a super source and send it out to the world. Um, so uh, 
so this has kind of been like, you know, the, the end all and be all of where we've been over the last two years. Um, we have learned a ton. Um, we um, have been able to stay in business only because of all this technology uh, that um, has come into play. And most of it really in the last two years. This ATEM uh, that I talked about, uh, the, the smaller version came out just before the pandemic. Um, this company was so in the right place at the right time. They've sold just, you know, hand over fist selling these things. Um, no problems uh, um, uh, capitalizing on a market at, at that time. So I'm sorry, uh, I definitely talked too much in the beginning. Um, I really enjoy this stuff. I would love to uh, talk to any one of you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, um, uh, I have a link that I'm going to pop into the um, chat. If, um, if anybody wants to, uh, didn't go, what am I doing wrong? Well, I will pop it into the chat, um, but I, I'm, I'm going to post a link so that if you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me, I'm happy to talk to you more about this. Um, it's really exciting stuff. Everybody needs something different. So this was kind of, um, you know, the soup to nuts, uh, uh, wide variety of everything. Um, I think we're out of time. Thanks, Steve. And Steve will do a Q&A in a session room now. And in general, the session rooms will be open until 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, and whatever time in other places. Thanks, all. <laughs>